After yet another Buckeye beatdown, it is a time for truth. Next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it, Tim Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it, get it, touchdown night again. Just before Brazil got him, and a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle, caught by Kohler at the five on his feet, touchdown Michigan! On his way, it's good! He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan, but Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schembeck. And here's your first play, pressure coming, second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace, and welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Of course, our maize and blue daubers are down after receiving yet another beating, the hands of those Buckeyes. And I think that has pretty much all of us right now that root for the artist formerly known as the leaders in the best, at least in football, I think that has all of us right now looking and searching for answers. So on this week's episode... We're going to try to find some. In the next segment, my partners over at Wolverine Digest, Michael Spath and Brandon Brown, will be joining us. We'll take a little true-false test with them as they try to help us get to the root of where the Michigan football program is and ultimately where it can go. But I want to begin by tackling excuses. I, it's, I, it's not a good word. It's kind of a mean word. But I've seen a lot of excuses whether it's been in my own uh, feed, the comment section here, the various message boards, et cetera. And so I want to tackle some of these common Michigan fan tropes, AKA excuses here to open up this week's podcast. Let's begin with excuse number one, that Ohio state cheats. Now, now let's just say that's true, but let's say that Ohio state is cheating to get players will either turn them in or stop giving cryptic, passive-aggressive quotes to John U. Bacon about hard-to-beat-the-cheaters or cryptic tweets. Either turn them in or shut up because it sounds like you're whining. And, and whining is for people who either don't have the balls to do what must be done or they just um, are looking for uh, excuses because they're not good enough. So if they're cheating, then turn them in. Bo Schembechler turned in Illinois for cheating back in the 1980s. Woody Hayes turned in Michigan State for cheating back in the 1970s. So if they're cheating, and there's a, there's a message board post right now on the Wolverines uh, premium site, that's the Michigan Rival site where I've been a subscriber for probably 20 years, that is detailing all these specific ways uh, schools, including Ohio State, cheat. If that stuff is true, turn them in. Call them, if you're a Michigan coach and they're cheating, why haven't you turned them in? And then on a, on a broader level, if they're cheating, so what? 
N- name me another context in all of human existence that it is considered unethical to buy a single mom a home, to pay for a poor family's electric bill or buy them a car. There is nowhere else on all of planet Earth, no other human endeavor where it is considered tawdry and, and unethical to provide for people in such predicaments than these stupid NCAA rules. So who's got more money than Michigan? Answer, not many. So that's a you problem. The only people who care about NCAA rules are the people who are in no danger of breaking them in the first place. Okay, so that excuse is lame. How about excuse number two? Let's see if this one's better. That Ohio State doesn't care about academics. Well, um, last year, Ohio State had a higher APR than Michigan. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't believe it either. I had to look it up thrice, but it's true. Now, both had very good APRs. Ohio State's was just a little bit better. Number two in the Big Ten, in fact, behind only Northwestern. Michigan right behind them at number three. Ohio State was 987. Michigan was at 982. But Ohio State had the better APR last year. So let's try another one. Let's try excuse number three, shall we? Ohio State lets its players take online courses. Well, right now, my wife is in the midst of getting her second master's degree online at Liberty University. Millions of Americans take online courses. The University of Michigan offers online courses. I would imagine that if a Michigan player suffered a serious injury like a broken leg or a blown uh, knee ligament, he couldn't get around campus, that they would have him take, guess what? Online courses. Now, this is a reference to um, Justin Fields saying, Ohio State's great quarterback, that he takes online courses, and that gives him more time uh, to, to study and watch football. So what? And yes, I understand Michigan is the number one ranked public university in the world. By the way, Ohio State's ranked the 17th best public university in America, according to U.S. News and World Report. I looked that up, too. So, uh, and uh, well, it's easier to cheat with online courses. You're right. Don't, there was never any academic cheating in college sports until we had online courses. I remember sitting in class as an undergrad at Michigan State University. Why did I go there? I am the, I am the living embodiment of the joke. I went to Michigan State because I couldn't get into Michigan. That's the, that's the truth. I couldn't get in. My, my ACT score on, my, on, on math was so low, Michigan wouldn't let me in. But Michigan State did. And I, I remember I sat right there in a philosophy class once when a couple of Michigan State players, one of them went on to the NFL. I was sitting right between them. We're openly cheating and giving each other answers on the exam right there in class. We didn't have, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet when this had occurred back in 1992, 93, whenever it was. All right, so I don't get this whole online course thing. Millions of Americans have degrees from online courses. It's one of the primary vehicles universities have used uh, to actually uh, grow their student bodies as well as their revenue. I, this one, I just don't. I, I, this is the lamest excuse of them all. And I think these are all pretty lame. But let's try, uh, let's try excuse number four. Maybe this one has more, more credibility. We can never match Ohio State's obsession Meaning that, um, you know, they, they cross the, the word M out, uh, that, or the letter M out, I should say that, uh, they, they, they practice all year for us. You know, when, when Bo Schembechler built the, the Michigan program back from ruin, when he took over in 1969, he so emulated everything Ohio state did. We ran their offense, their defense. Everything, because Bo had a hand in creating that. He was Woody's offensive coordinator for several years. He, he, he worked so painstakingly to emulate Ohio State, the class of the league, that he earned the nickname Little Woody. When celebrated former Michigan defensive coordinator Bill McCartney left Michigan to go take over the Colorado football program, and Nebraska was the top of the heap in the old Big Eight, he did the exact same thing, emulated everything Nebraska did. What do you mean we can't match their obsession? No, it's, it's not that we can't. 
It's that we won't. Those are two totally different things. There's a, a very popular message board rumor that a marginal player on the Michigan team, his parents uh, like to go on social media groups and sow dissension and complain about the program. And they were the source of the Zach Charbonnet had his knee scope and he's out for the year rumor a couple of months back. If that's all true, why is that young man still in this program? Do you know what would happen at Ohio State if a marginal player's parents were popping off in a Facebook group? Either Urban Meyer or Ryan Day would call that young man into his office and say, hey, what do you think about Cincinnati, Ohio? I've got good news for you. You're going to be playing there. Have a nice life. Because that's what Bo would do. Pull that crap on Bo. Hey, would he, you ever been to Mount Pleasant, Michigan? Or Ypsilanti, just you know, right across the street there. No? Gosh. It's your lucky day, kid. Because you're going to be playing for Central or Eastern Michigan here next week. Have a nice life. Tell your parents I said hello. We got your scholarship filled already. No, no, no. It's, it's not that we cannot match their obsession. It's that we won't. Those are two totally different things. Our fifth excuse. We can never overcome the talent gap. I love this one. Yes, Ohio State is more talented, man, 1 to 85. But last I checked, only 22 players, 11 on each side, played at a time. Therefore, it doesn't really matter if Ohio State has three running backs and we only have one or two that are good. They're only playing one at a time. It, it doesn't matter who's got four good quarterbacks. Actually, we have the deeper quarterback room this year, but it doesn't matter. You're only playing one of those guys at a time. Hey, here's a question for you. Do, you. do you think the talent gap is why Michigan's five-star receiver, Donovan Peoples-Jones, just kept dropping all those balls against Ohio State. Do you think the talent gap is why consensus top 100 recruit Tariq Black ran on a third and 10 and an eight-yard route, and then instead of fighting for the first down, just ran out of bounds? Do you think the talent gap is why two of your senior captains played terrible games, Josh Metellus and Kalik Hudson? Think, do you think do you, do you think if Michigan had four, three or four more five star players, that when Kalik Hudson was looking right at that ball on that punt, and then still jumped offsides, do you think he would have thought, you know what, we've got four or five other four, five star players, I'm not going to jump offsides now. Th this argument has no merit. If it's only about talent gaps, how did Iowa and Purdue beat these guys? And if it's only about talent gaps. How did Wisconsin beat us 38 to 14? I mean, if, if recruiting rankings solve all, I'm not disputing that Ohio State doesn't have the more talented team. But Michigan has one fewer four and five star recruit on its roster than Clemson does right now. One, one. You want to talk about talent gaps? If you think the talent, the, the recruiting gap between Michigan and Ohio State is wide, have you looked at the recruiting gap between Michigan and Wisconsin? Final, Wisconsin 38, Michigan 14. No, again, yet another, another excuse offered up as a reason. None of these five excuses explain the last 16 years. 16 years. 16 years. No. And excuses remain for losers unworthy of the winged helmet, unworthy of the block M, certainly not the, not the things of victors valiant. We should be better than this. Hey, I want to introduce you to a brand new partner of ours here at Michigan Podcast, Hero Soap Company. Check these guys out. Veteran-owned soap company. Sign up for a subscription and get soap delivered right to your door each and every month. Three different options, starting at just five bucks a month, all the way up to the battalion package, or as I like to call it, the Buckeye package. Three bars of soap each month for those Buckeye fans out there who need some extra help getting that stink off. The best part of this is Hero Soap Company donates a portion of each purchase to help veterans and active military, something all of us can unite behind. Wolverines, Buckeyes, Sparties alike. Use the promo code Michigan Podcast and get 10% off of your order. 
promo code Michigan Podcast, all one word, and get high quality soap without having to go to the store. Hero Soap Company. Check them out online at HeroSoapCompany.com. Let freedom clean. Back here on Michigan Podcast, it's now time for the roundtable portion of this week's episode, and I'm joined for that roundtable by my partners over at Wolverine Digest, also with WTKA and Ann Arbor, Michael Spath and Brandon Brown. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. So for the roundtable this week, continuing with the theme we started the show off with, A Time for Truth, I have prepared nine true or false statements. I'm going to give you guys each a ch- a guys, give you guys the chance to answer each and every one of them. And these are from various perspectives, pro Harbaugh, anti Harbaugh, confused, because I, I want us to have a really holistic view at this big picture of where the program is at and where it stands. Are you ready to go? Sure. Let's do it. All right. True or false, number one. The best case outcome for the remainder of the Harbaugh era is he performs like John Cooper did at Ohio State in years 6 through 11. 83% wins, a Heisman winner, three Big Ten titles, three top six finishes, two wins in the game, and two major bowl, two major bowl wins. That is the absolute best case scenario is that Jim Harbaugh turns out to be Michigan's John Cooper. Because his first five years, their records are pretty similar. Michael, is that true or false? Well, if it's true, can you sign me up for that right now? I mean, you're telling me that in in the Jim Harbaugh era, who won three Big Ten titles, he'll beat Ohio State three times, and uh, and he'll win, have two major bowl victories, which I assume would be like getting to a like one playoff game or getting to the Rose Bowl. I mean, from where Michigan is and where Michigan's been these last 15 years, where it's been these last five years, if you could sign me up for that, like hell yeah, I would take that in a heartbeat. I don't. I mean, that is best case scenario. I don't think that that is. That's not even in my in my pipe dream right now. Like when we we talked about it on uh, on our radio show on Tuesday, what our expectations were uh, coming into the Harbaugh era and how high they were and like how we've had to readjust them. And my expectations are far lower than that for the next five to eight years now. So you give me that, um, and I will be I will be whistling, uh, walking down the street with a big smile on my face. Uh, over the next eight years. Brandon? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the rest of your questions are yet, Steve, but that's probably the biggest true on the list. I'm just going to go <laughs> I'll throw that out there. I don't know if that's <laughs> going to be accurate or not, but I mean, he hasn't done anything close to that yet, so how could you not say true to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the facts are the facts. If he does those things, there's there's no way that Michigan fans could be unhappy. I mean, there, I mean, wins against Ohio State, wins, and, wins uh, conference titles, a Heisman winner. I mean, Michigan isn't sniffing any of those things right now. So absolutely true. Imagine December 30th, 2014 and being told that you were going to hope that he's your new John Cooper. Imagine being told that. (laughs) Yikes. All right. True, false. Number two, the talent gap between Michigan and Ohio State is actually growing wider. The further into Harbaugh's recruiting that we get. Brandon, is that true or false? I think it's true. I think if you any metric that you can look at will prove that. I mean, we talked about it earlier this week. I know Michael brought it up using the uh, 24/7 composite composite class composite scores. Um, I'll, I'll let Mike give the specific number because I don't remember them. But it's the the scores are farther apart now than they were when he started. And I think when you look at how many guys are getting put in the NFL year after year by Ohio State compared to Michigan and I mean, shoot, what it looks like on the field, I don't know how you can say that that's false. I'll, I'll say that the gap is wider now than it was when he started. Michael? Yeah, I mean, if you want the numbers, uh, so use 24-7 sports composite rankings, which uh, essentially they, they look at, and I know, you, Steve, you do this too mm-hmm. uh, for Wolverine Digest. Um, it looks like every recruit, every player that's currently on the active roster, so it's usually when the, you know, the fir- week of the first game, uh, and then what their high school ranking was, and it adds that all up and comes up with like a point total. And generally speaking, there's only like two or three teams a year that are 900 or better, and that's Alabama, Ohio State, uh, once in a while LSU, once in a while USC. Um, and then there's a lot of programs in the, between like 800 and, and 900. And generally speaking, Michigan the last five years has been around 850 uh, or so, and Ohio State's been north of 900. Well, when this thing first started in 2015, 
uh, Harbaugh's first year, Ohio State was 50 points better than Michigan, uh, which is which is a good amount, but it's essentially the equivalent of like three or four more four or five stars in the program. Here we are five years later, and Ohio State is 120 points uh, ahead of Michigan, which is the equivalent of about 10 to 12 four or five, star, five stars more than Michigan has. And so, yes, I mean, the numbers, if you, if you believe in this type of thing, um, and there's really no other way to, to accurately measure it, uh, then Ohio State has been getting more talented, and Michigan has kind of just been staying the same uh, during the five years of the Harbaugh era. And so in that respect, the gap has gotten wider. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought uh, Ari Wasserman from The Athletic wrote about that was very true is he said, um, take – you know, if you, if you took every person on Ohio State and put them over Michigan, how many would start on Michigan's team? And, you know, you could say quarterback, running back, probably uh, at least three of the offensive linemen, you know, the wide receivers, um, and then just, you know, on and on and on. And if you did the same thing for Michigan and put those put those guys on uh, Ohio State's team, how many players would start for Ohio State? I bet it's a lot less. And so that's another sign of the, the – the gap just getting bigger and bigger. All right. True, false statement. Number three, if you've never won a conference title in nine years as a college football coach, it's far more likely you will never win one than it is. You'll still win several of them. Michael. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. I mean, we're, we're getting, we're getting further and further into this thing and, you know, everybody wants, everybody's trying to point to the, the Dabo, and I, I put it in an article, kind of like let everybody, like, is this what it's going to be? I mean, I don't believe it. Brandon doesn't believe it. I don't think you believe it. Um, it's going to get harder and harder and harder to get to that level because your top competitor is pulling further away, and you can't sell results anymore. You're selling, you're still trying to sell hope to recruits, and recruits are smart enough to get packed to, to you know, not buy into that anymore. Um yeah, I, I think Dabo Sweeney is a, a I don't know, what's a rare bird, a dodo bird or something. I mean, he's the exception, not the rule. If he was, then a lot of other people would be, you know, getting to year five, getting to year six, not winning one, and all of a sudden breaking through. I, I, I think it's much more likely that, um, you know, we see maybe one Big Ten title in the next, in the rest of the Jim Harbaugh era, and it's just going to get harder and harder to win it. I, I Based on my research, guys, there isn't a current college football coach in, in the Power Five that if he didn't win a conference title by the end of his fourth season at his current school has ever gone on to win one. Dabo won his at the end of his fourth season. Uh, Jimmy, of course, will be going into year six next year. So, uh, Because let's face it, most of the time if you don't win a conference title your first three or four years, you don't get a fifth year in today's yeah, college you football. Fired. You get fired, yep. yeah. Brandon, what are your thoughts on that on that statement? Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you haven't won one yet, I mean, he hasn't even played for one yet, let alone win one. I mean, he hasn't even gone to Indy. So every year that Ohio State gets better and Michigan kind of stays the same, I don't think Michigan's going backwards, but every year that Ohio State gets better and Michigan stays the same, the gap's getting wider and wider. I mean, everybody was up in arms, and the, and the, the, the narrative was that maybe Michigan needed to look elsewhere after last year's 23-point loss in Columbus. Well, this year they got served a 29-point loss in Ann Arbor. So, I mean, it's not getting closer. It's not getting more likely that he's going to make a Big Ten title game. And then, oh, yeah, you got to win it while you're there as well. You know, it's not like that's a gimme just getting there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see how you can think, like, next year and year six with the schedule and, you know, who's coming back and, you know, what may happen between now and then. I don't think you can say that they'd be any closer to it. So it seems like it's getting farther and farther away. Next true false question. This is number five. Um, since or number four, since Michigan isn't willing to have its university serve the football program, like what happens in football factories like Ohio State, Alabama, and Georgia, it can't possibly join that elite group because it lacks the in-state recruiting base a program like an LSU has to compete with those guys. Is that true or false, Brandon? Oh man, I, I just. <clears throat> I, I get I have some hang ups with these kinds of with these kind of sentiments. It just sounds like a it just sounds like a loser's attitude. I don't know. I, I, I what does that really mean, you know, a university serving its football program? I mean, I think a lot of what Michigan does is is centered around the football program because it's such a money maker and it's such a huge brand. 
and it's a huge reason why enrollment is where it is. I mean, all those things are true. So I look, I, Brandon, I, 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 I want to stop you because I'm, I, I've been assured all Michigan football players are pre-med or, <laughs> or have, uh, have, are going to replace Neil for Neil Forbush at NASA, uh, any uh, Forbush anytime soon. And every single one of them, um, I mean, we practice less than every other, uh, big time college football program because our guys are taking two, three times the credits. I, I've been, I've been assured this on various message boards who also have insiders saying that, uh, Michigan lost to Ohio state Saturday because too many fans sold their tickets to Buckeyes. I've been assured of these uh, things. Yeah. Reading your sarcasm loud and clear here. I just think that's crap. I, I, I mean, like, you're, you're Michigan. You, you claim leaders and best. You claim most wins all time. You claim most Big Ten championships. You claim this. You claim that. Like, that, that's, that's played. I, I, so I don't know if this is answering your question truly or falsely, but I just think that, I think that Michigan is supposed to be playing with those, with those schools and they're not. I mean, I know Michigan, I know football is different now than it was 50, 60 years ago when Michigan was dominating almost everybody, but it's still, it still to me is a huge part of what the university is all about, what it stands for, why kids want to go there, what, you know, what college football Saturday is like in Ann Arbor is, a, I, I just, I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts with that question, but I still think like, I mean, yeah, like let's, let's be, let's be real here. If a lot of, if the players on Michigan's football team weren't playing football, they wouldn't go to Michigan, and that's the fact. So I don't remember exactly how you worded your question, but I, I think that I just think that that's a I just think that that's a cop out. I think that's a I think that's a poor excuse and just trying to justify getting beat by your rival year in and year out. Michael, you agree that's a poor excuse, or do you think it has merit? Um, I think we don't know, honestly. I think we. I've talked to a lot of former athletes and there's a lot of stories out there uh, that just from the demands that, that football brings um, and what the, the amount of revenue and everything that's tied into it, uh, that the opportunity to pursue the degree arguably that they want um, doesn't really happen. You, you can't, you generally can't be both a huge success in the classroom and a huge success on the football field is what I'm, was what I'm told over and over again. But I, I don't really know what that means. I mean, does it mean like Michigan is accepting a whole bunch of players that wouldn't qualify on their own? Uh, I mean, I guess if we, if, if every single guy is honest with us about what their GPA is and what their ACT is score is, then we could say, yeah, that's probably true. Um, you know, do we know enough about each individual athlete to say that, you know, they are going to class or they've got to do this or they've got to do that? I, I, I think on the flip side, we don't know that either. I mean, I, I think what you've got is you've got very proud Michigan alums and fans that think that their school is different than everybody else's with the exception of like Notre Dame, Northwestern, Stanford, and Duke, that those are the ones that they're, they're like. And that's a pride thing. And that's a, hey, we see our, we see Michigan ranked in the U.S. News and World Report and and they're just trying to justify essentially themselves like we do it a certain way and that's how we can you know rise above and be all high and mighty and uh act like sure we don't, we're not winning but we're but that's because we're the bastion of of morality i don't i don't know that they're i don't think that they're right but i don't think that i don't know if they're wrong either because we just don't have that type of access and that type of information but i would tell people to get off that horse um because they they can't say that. And certainly we've heard from enough former athletes that say like, Hey, we don't get an opportunity to pursue a business degree. We don't have an opportunity to pursue a law degree to pursue a medicine degree. Uh, so I would, I would stop using it as an argument. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and also say like that Michigan is a football factory like everybody else. Okay. Question number five, Michael, this goes back to you. True or false. It's really just that Michigan has to go through Ohio state. That's the problem. Washington got to the playoff. Oklahoma has twice and might make it three this year. Or Utah or Baylor might make it this year. Notre Dame made it last year. Those programs aren't really that much better than Michigan's. They just don't have to go through Ohio State. Is that true or false? I think that's, I think that's true. I think it's true. I think if you dropped Ohio State in the Pac-12, we never see Washington. I think you dropped Ohio State uh, into the Big 12, uh, I think you, could, you might still see Oklahoma here and there, but they certainly wouldn't be this dominant program 
of the last five years. Uh, if you drop them into, uh, you know, if you if you made Notre Dame play them, I don't think Notre Dame is playing in the playoff. Um, you know, it's it, 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 they're the, they're the one of the three or four best teams in college football over the last eight years. And, and they're a juggernaut and they're really hard to beat. And so, um, yeah, Michigan's a little bit cursed in the fact that uh, they've got to play Ohio State every year. It's, it's, it's a little bit like in the ACC. Everybody has to play Clemson and nobody can beat Clemson right now. And in the SEC, I mean, there's a couple of good programs. Now, here's, here's the thing is that the SEC is a perfect example of this is if you have a juggernaut, if you have a, a, a Goliath, like they did with Alabama, you just got to find a way to rise up to their level. And, you know, LSU has done so this year. Georgia's trying to do so on a regular basis. Uh, Auburn has beaten Alabama a couple of times and has won a national championship. You know, Florida is trying to get there with, uh, with Dan Mullen. I mean, you've just got to find a way. Just because you have a Goliath in your, in your conference doesn't give you an excuse that you should never win. Um, it just makes your job that much harder. Brandon, I'm guessing you agree with that? I do. Yeah, we t- we talked about this earlier today on the radio, and I-, I said almost exactly what Michael. I think Michael actually asked, like, what would happen if you took Notre Dame and put them in the Big Ten? What would they do against Ohio State? I said lose. I mean, so it's, it it is it is what it is. I mean, Ohio State's as good as any program in the country, and they have been for a handful of years. Notre Dame's actually played them happened. in two major bowl games. Remember, during this sixteen year run that of of misery that Michigan's had, they played them in the year that we all learned AJ Hawk was going to marry Brady Quinn's sister, or maybe it was the other way around. I don't remember. Uh, and then there was the uh, the the linebacker that got hurt for Notre Dame. That was the cautionary tale, and guys started skipping bowl games after that, and they got mm-hmm. destroyed yeah, in both yeah. of those games. So that that that. Kind Kind of goes to what you're talking about. Yeah, and I, you know, I said the same thing. If you slip, you know, if you go ahead and stick Ohio State in the ACC for the last handful of years, I don't know if Clemson. I mean, I know Clemson beat them, but I, if you started it six, eight years ago, before Clemson is what they are now, or last year or the year before, maybe they're never Clemson. Totally different, yeah. totally different uh, scenario as well. So it is what it is. I mean, I, it's it's a bummer for Michigan and Michigan fans that Ohio State is as good as they've ever been in their entire existence right now. But yeah, I I think, you know, I think Ohio state has just been that good and it's, it's just the way that it's played out. Okay. Next true false statement. Now this is number six, Michigan must hold on to Harbaugh because he's the best the school can get despite going 0 and five against Ohio state, winning zero big 10 titles and going two and 10 against top 10 teams. Brandon, you get this one first. Oh boy. I mean, I think in theory it's false. I think in theory it's false, but I think on the surface and when you actually start naming names, it's true. I don't know. That's that kind of a, it's kind sure. of a cop out. Cause I eventually you're not names, hiring but... a hypothetical, you're hiring an actual person. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, Oh man. I mean, Jim Harbaugh is winning a lot of games, but he's winning a lot of games that he should win. He's losing games that he, that he's, you know, going up against other opponents that have equal or, close to equal or maybe more talent. Eventually you'd like to see a coach break through that wall and take the next step and take a team to another level. And he hasn't done that. Now, now the question is just, okay, who is there? Who is out there that can't be that guy that can't do that? I mean, Dabble Sweeney, Lincoln Riley, uh, Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, all these guys have started somewhere and have been successful at various levels, but eventually they took it to another, just another tier and are now the elite of the elite. Um, so it's 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 dumb to think that there's nobody else out there like that, but it's just really hard to find that person. We've seen a lot of programs try and fail over the years, including Michigan, not that long ago. So that's a really loaded question. I, I guess I'll say I just think that going 0-5 against Ohio State and not even playing for a Big Ten title in five years is a, is a fireable offense. So I will, say, I will say false. Michigan does not need to hang on to Jim Harbaugh, but – if they do, I can't say I, I don't understand because he's putting butts in the seats, he's making the school a lot of money, and he is winning a high majority of his games, just not the ones that everybody really, really wants him to win. What do you think, Michael? I think Brandon said everything that I want to say because this question drives me up a wall. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Brandon knows this. You You know this. We've had enough conversations. I mean, Look, everybody, the, the, everybody is so afraid. Every Michigan fan is so afraid of 
going back to the Rich Rodriguez and Brady Hoke days that they cannot fathom parting ways with Jim Harbaugh because they think that whoever Michigan hires is going to be a bum that wins five or six games or four games or goes three and nine. And, you know, that that's the anomaly. Michigan had, um, you know, three head coaches for, for the course of about 35 years before those guys. And they had one six and six season in that 35 year stretch. And then a guy comes in who wants to completely overhaul everything that U of M does. Um, it, 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 he doesn't have the recruits to run his system. He screws Michigan up for three years. And then when they tr- uh, bring in a new coach to try to change back, he screws up the next coach for the next three years. That's an anomaly. That's not what would happen here. Jim Harbaugh has, uh, what, four recruiting classes that all rank in the top 15 in, in across the country. Three of them, I think, are in the top 10. Um, this, this, there's a lot of talent on this team. Everybody plays about the same nowadays. Everybody runs a version of the spread offense. So you're not coming in here and a guy going like, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to uh, go back to the, the wishbone. Let's recruit players for the <laughs> wishbone to try to win this thing. That's not what this would be. You'd go out there and hire somebody who's literally going to run the same type of offense that Josh Gaddis runs with the same type of personnel that you need to do it and is going to have a defense that's like, hey, I've got a lot of athletes that I'm uh, picking up that can play man-to-man that can play zone defense. So, and, and then, you know, the other thing, too, is that you've got Rutgers and Maryland performing an all-time low. You've still got Indiana. You've got Purdue. Um, you've got Michigan State on the downward trend. You've got Northwestern on a downward trend. I mean, there's going to be you're, – you're going to have seven or eight wins. Brandon and I talk about this all the time. You're going to have seven or eight wins essentially guaranteed because – you can out recruit everybody and you're not going to try to blow up the system. So are there coaches out there that can win eight games besides Jim Harbaugh? Absolutely. Are there coaches out there that can win 10 games besides Jim Harbaugh? Absolutely. Is there a coach out there that can beat Ohio state and get Michigan to Indianapolis and play for a national championship? That's the question. If you believe that there is, and your current guy has shown an inability to do so, then maybe you move on from him. If you truly believe, if you're Ward Manuel, if you're the fans, that there's nobody else out there that can get past Ohio State and that can get to a national championship, then you might as well just stick with what you got because what you got is working well enough to win you 10 games. But that's, that's what it ultimately comes down to. Is there someone that can do better than Harbaugh without, and acknowledge that nobody you hire bringing in is going to go back to the Rich Rod days? It's just not going to happen. And I think so many people don't want to go to Harbaugh because they're afraid of Rich Rod and they don't understand the dynamic that that is gone and done with and never going to happen again. Well said. By the way, Juwan Howard already has as many wins over top 10 teams as Jim Harbaugh does. Three, <laughs> three more of these to go. It's true, unfortunately. Uh, three, more, or three more of these to go. Number seven. Uh, Michigan has the resources and reach to turn an upcoming coach who's a grinder like a Matt Campbell or Matt Rule type, into the next Urban Meyer. But the risk of trying to identify who that might specifically be isn't worth giving it a shot. Michael, back to you. I mean, that's that's what we're talking about here. That's the that's the game. That's the what you have to do is you like you have to be able to identify talent and the next up and comer. And that's a hard thing to do. I mean, Dabo Sweeney was not supposed to be that guy. No, he was the wide receivers coach. Yeah. Yeah, he was an interim coach, and he turned out to be a superstar. It's like, okay, you know, the person that that hired Urban Meyer to Utah, he had to look at Urban Meyer at Bowling Green and say, look, there's a lot of guys who have won in the MAC. Each year there seems to be a different flavor of the month in the MAC. I'm picking this guy to be the next great thing. And then he was, so you have got to have some really, really um, you've got to be a great leader. You've got to be a great CEO and you've got to be identif- be able to identify talent better than anybody else. And if you don't believe that you're capable of that, then you stay, you stick with what you got because then it is a little bit too much uh, of, of a risk. If you don't think you can identify um, who the next great guy is, it's a hard thing to do. We look at, we see fortune 500 companies that hire new CEOs and 
a year later, that person's out on their ram because mm-hmm. they didn't deliver what you thought. I mean, this is the hardest part is you've got a very successful uh, business. And do you go out there and hire that person to take you the next 10 years into the future and revolution and, and get you to the highest heights? Or do you go out there and hire that person who a year from now you're bankrupt and your toys are us? That's what it comes down to. Brandon. Yeah, it's really tough because Michigan has gone a couple of different routes before Jim Harbaugh got to Ann Arbor, and neither of them worked. And that's what Michael was just talking about in the last question about how Michigan fans are just terrified of making the wrong decision because they did it twice. I mean, Rich Rodriguez was the hottest name in college football, bar none. Alabama wanted him the year before he came to Michigan, Yep, and, and he flamed out for, for a myriad of reasons. I mean, the books are out there, all the stories that have been documented. We all know that he wasn't a great fit from day one. Whatever you want to say, it didn't work out. So then they tried to do the other thing, what Michael just said, try to go out and find that Mac coach who's kind of been outperforming a little bit, has a little moxie, has a little something to him. And, oh, by the way, he had Michigan connections, so they bring in Brady Hoke and – he was in over his head. I mean, he wasn't, he just wasn't the guy. It was pretty clear after that first year that he just was not, he was not cut out to run a program like Michigan. So it's, it's tough. It's really, really tough to, to try to strike gold on, on, on a risk on a low, low pro, a lower program head coach. And even the sure thing isn't a sure thing all the time. So it's, yeah, I mean, these two questions are kind of linked together. It's, it's about finding the right guy if you think you want to go another direction. But ultimately, I just don't know if that's even in Ward Manuel's thought process. It doesn't seem like it. So this might all be a moot point because I don't really know if that's even part of what he's thinking about is, you know, looking to make a change. So, you know, we'll see what happens with this bowl game and how that looks and plays out and all that good stuff before we start really getting into it. But for right now, that doesn't even really seem to be part of the plan. Brandon, we'll go back to you here with number eight. Michigan would be better off if Jim Harbaugh left for the NFL on his own. I think that's, man, I feel like that might, I feel like that's probably true. Even though he just came out and said that that wasn't absolutely was not going to happen. Not that long ago. I mean, I I guess I think about it like this, like, you know, Jim Harbaugh is kind of a different guy. We all know that he has little, he has some quirky things and, We've heard he might not be the greatest at, you know, given the rah-rah speech, that's not really the thing that he does. and Doesn't seem to be the most personable dude in the world. So if he leaves on his own, are players really going to, like, are they going to be heartbroken by that? I, 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 I don't know if we can really answer that question, but it's not, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, I don't, I don't think players would be fawning all, you know, falling all over the place thinking, no, he's got to stay, we've got to do whatever we can to get him to stay. There's no movie scene like that, I think, if, if Jim Harbaugh decided to pick up and leave. That might be the best, that might be the best case. Uh, I don't think that will happen. I mean, I, I don't know. Jim Harbaugh is a really competitive guy. There's no doubt about that. And I can't imagine how he feels about going 0-5. I think we forget about that sometimes. Mm-hmm. As much as Michigan fans hate it and as much as we hate talking about it every day, how do you think he feels? I mean, he's the one losing those games. Uh, so... I don't, that's a really tough question too. The best case scenario, if that's how it's worded, I guess I'll say true. Um, but it's, it's probably not good in a lot of ways. I mean, he came out and said that it wasn't going to happen to try to save the recruiting class. This happens every year. Other schools, you know, start talking about him potentially going back to the league. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if anybody in the league wants him. I mean, that's a whole other angle. Like, why would you at this point? What has he shown that he could come back to the NFL and do anything? So, I guess I'll say true just in terms of if there's going to be a change, that might be the smoothest way to do it. But again, I don't know if that's something that he's willing to do or if that's even an option for him right now. Michael, what do you think? Um, I mean, I think this. I think whether Harbaugh is here or Harbaugh is not, I think the Michigan program will be fine because it's set up for uh, success um, in a way that it wasn't set up for success when Lloyd retired when Rich Rod got fired uh, and when Brady Hoke got fired. There's a lot of talent here. The facilities are, with the exception probably of Ohio State, uh, the best in the Midwest. Um, You know, all the resources are available uh, for anybody to come in and and do their job. Um, Does Harbaugh leave for the NFL, and would that be okay for for Michigan? I mean, yeah, again, I think – I think Michigan is going to be just fine one way or another. 
Um, and I don't know. I, I'm really, I, I'm not expecting that scenario to play out. Uh, I think it's more likely Harbaugh retires and kind of does like an Urban Meyer thing than he would go back to the NFL. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that one, honestly, but I'm not worried about it if it ever were to happen. Final question, Michael. You get to take this one first. Given the ceiling Michigan football appears to be at, Michigan should readdress future resources to go all out for basketball championships since it's obvious football's success in that championship arena has been capped, has reached its limit. Is that true or false? Well, I mean, I think the only way that you're going to go all out for basketball championships is if the one thing you do, the one thing that we've talked about doing in football too, and that's uh, put your, put your reputation and everything on the side and say, we're going to go be the next Duke or the next Kansas or the next Kentucky or the next uh, uh, UCLA. And we're, we're willing to kind of, um, you know, jump into the muck a little bit here. Cause other than that, like, I mean, honestly, you know, Juwan Howard's getting paid really well. He was able to hire every single assistant coach he wanted to hire. Uh, they have great, they have great uh, facilities. Uh, they spend a lot of money on recruiting. Um, I don't, I don't think there's anything in terms of like, Hey, they need to throw another $50 million at the program in order to make it a championship. I mean, the fact of the matter is that they are a championship program. They just aren't going to get the top 20 kids on a consistent basis or top 25 kids because they don't want to play the game the way everybody else plays it. And, so that's all that they really have to left to decide is if we're not going to win in the football, do we go out there and, uh, and cheat our way to a basketball title? And I don't think they have to. I think Dewan Howard, uh, we're going to see how dynamic a recruiter he is, and he might be able to get the job done without having to, uh, to wade into the, the gray areas. Um, so I'm going to give him that opportunity to do so. And for football, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just left like a lot of fans, like, okay, I mean, nothing's – Jim's not going anywhere. The administration really likes him. He makes a lot of money. He does things the right way. He wins nine, ten games a year. Uh, that's good enough for some. And so I'm just kind of sitting here and going to be a bystander and watch it uh, unfold. And whatever happens, happens. Uh, I don't love where the program is. I do think there's an opportunity where if you, if you were really, really trusted yourself and thought that you're a good person at mining that next generation and can bring in a superstar – an under the radar superstar, but but a superstar, I'd be all for it. But I, you know what, honestly, um, I don't know that I trust. Even he, he did that with. I shall, I say this. Let me rephrase. He just did it with uh, Juwan Howard. He he might have just done that with Juwan Howard. So maybe he's capable of doing it. But I don't think we're going to have to worry or have to talk about that for the next couple of years. Cause I don't think it's going to do it. Uh, they're going to do anything with it. Brandon, you get the last word. Yeah, I would say I would say false. I mean, I, I think it's a little too early in Jawan Howard's career as the head coach to even say that they need that. I mean, he. I mean, look where the program is sitting. I mean, granted, seven games in, but they've done some really, really wonderful things in a short amount of time. And Jawan Howard does seem to have a knack for recruiting some higher, higher profile kids that we just didn't see under John Beeline. So I think that needs to play out a little bit more. And then also. There's a there's a building on campus that holds 115,000 people that's never going to let anything like that happen. So, I mean, football is the is the breadwinner for the school. It's the breadwinner for the media. It's the breadwinner for the athletic program as a whole. So, so no, I, it's just it's just unrealistic. I mean, whether the basketball team, I mean, not if it if it happens, it's been more successful already over the last handful of years under John Beeline. But if the basketball team becomes you know, more of the flagship pro- flagship program in terms of be- winning bigger games and competing on a bigger stage, so be it. I don't think it's going to have anything to do with pumping more money into the program or wading into those murky waters that Mike talked about. I think it's just going to be because that's the way things have developed and that's the way that, uh, you know, that's the way Juwan Howard is, turning, is, is taking the program and running with it, and that's continuing to be what we see with the football team where it's, you know, kind of second fiddle to Ohio State and even – third or fourth fiddle, even in the Big Ten. I mean, kind of lost on all this is like, not only did Michigan lose to Ohio State, but they got beat down by Wisconsin and also lost to Penn State. Mm-hmm. Like, if Michigan wins those two games and goes 11-1 and one and loses to Ohio State, we're probably having a slightly different discussion. Sure. But they're not even they're not even doing that. So, right. I, I still don't think it matters. I think Michigan's always going to be kind of the, uh, you know, the centerpiece. But that doesn't mean that the basketball program can't be unbelievably successful under Jawan Howard. So I've got one more bonus question, and you can give me just a simple true or false. 
You can you can throw more detail in it, but given what the question is, you guys are probably going to be hesitant to do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> True or false? Jim Harbaugh either wins the Big Ten, Big Ten, and or beats Ohio State next season, or steps aside at the end of year six. I think false. I I, I mean I just don't think he's going to walk away, and I don't think he's going to win the Big Ten title next year. Brandon. I, I actually think that's true. I think if it gets to 0-6 against Ohio State and another year of not playing for a title, I think some of those pressures are going to mount and it's going to be a little much for them. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is like a turning point in what's going on, but at that press conference after the Ohio State game, it was a couple seconds away from spilling over into a mutiny and some weird stuff happening that you just normally don't see at press conferences. I mean, Harbaugh is kind of going at a reporter for asking what I thought was a perfectly – appropriate question and then you've got Jim Harbaugh's wife Sarah in the background yelling out at a reporter for asking a question and calling him a name it it just it was a bad vibe in there and I think if you get another year of that it's it's going to take it's going to go to somewhere that it just hasn't been yet Hmm. yeah you know what on that I'll say this family should not be in press conferences I I don't understand what that was all about I mean and it's happened before and we've you know, I've been in, we, we've been to ones before, whether it's basketball, women's basketball, ho- I mean, actually, I don't know if I've ever seen it at hockey before, and I've been covering hockey for a long time, but we've seen it before where, where family or friends are in the press conference, and it's just, uh, there's just no place for it. I mean, it's a professional environment. It's not, um, you know, I think sometimes people in the, the, the I understand it's a very difficult job and for a family to watch your husband, to watch your son, to watch whatever, uh, get, um, you know, get criticized. It's gotta be immensely difficult. Yeah. But the, but the press doesn't work for Michigan. It just doesn't. And, and so, you know, it works for the people. It works for the fans that shell out the money. It works for, uh, 115,000 that are paying for, uh, all these rights and things like that. And so they just have no business being in press conferences. Gentlemen, excellent conversation. I think our audience, uh, I know, is going to really enjoy it. Thanks for joining us again this week here on Michigan Podcast. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Michigan Podcast brought to you by Wolverine Digest, now part of Sports Illustrated. That's right, the SI.com network. That's myself, Steve Dace, Michael Spath, and Brandon Brown bringing you tons of content each and every day at WolverineDigest.com, and it's all free. Analysis, video, commentary, breakdowns, everything you need to be an informed Michigan fan, you're going to get it every single day at WolverineDigest.com. And keep in mind, we don't require access to the program in order for us to generate content. So we give you unvarnished, unfiltered analysis. Yes, we're Michigan fans. We want Michigan to do well, but we don't see it any other way other than calling balls and strikes, and that includes the home team, too. Go to WolverineDigest.com now. This week's Twitter poll, we asked you, will Jim Harbaugh win as many Big Ten titles in years 6 through 10 at Michigan as John Cooper did at Ohio State, which was three? 91% of you said no. 9% said yes. And I, I also would have voted no. Which brings us to this week's question of the week from Nick Henderlong, who says, How do you think Michigan basketball, which went through a decade of death, has accomplished so much more than Michigan football in the last 10 years. They always seem to make the big play, whereas the football team doesn't. I think John Beeline is a better college basketball coach than Jim Harbaugh is a college football coach. I I, I think Jim Harbaugh is a very good college football coach. I think John Beeline is an elite 1% coach, and I think that's the difference. But excellent question, Nick. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Hopefully it lived up to its advanced billing. This is, after all, a time for truth. Want to thank all of you for tuning in. Don't forget, like, subscribe, share, whether it's uh, YouTube uh, or iTunes or Stitcher, Google Play. However you access us each and every week in those five-star reviews, those help a ton as well. Special thanks to our friends at Detroit Sports Podcast for sharing and spreading the word about this too. To all of the rest of you, thanks for tuning in and Until the next time, go blue.